heard the wives a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord, but you don't really care for music, do you? Goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing Hallelujah, 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 Hi, Hallelujah. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. Saw her bathing on the roof, her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to her kitchen chair, she broke your throne, she cut your hair. From your lips she drew the hallelujah. Thank you. Baby, I've been here before. I've seen this room and I've walked this floor. I used to live alone before I knew you. That does not, mm -hmm, that does not a victory march. It's cold and it's a broken. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hello. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What's up, Jordan? Hallelujah. Rock on, bro. It was a pistol, a Smith and Wesson. Holy, holy shit! La 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 la
What's up, everyone? How are we doing? I uh, I just put up this Christmas tree, so I was feeling like uh, playing some music. What's up? What's up? Y'all are all waving. Y'all are awesome. One of my fave songs. It is. It's one of mine too. I love gun song. I love anything by the Lumineers. They're they're awesome. Look at this filter on my face. It looks weird. I like a doll. I thought it'd be fun. It got some sparkles. Put me in the Christmas mood. Um, mm, what do I want to sing? Mm. I should probably think about this before I like just start playing. See if I know any more, like, what's a Lumineer song I haven't done in a while? I could do a, maybe like a Mumford and Sons song? Hmm. Well, I came home like a stone and I feel here comments hold on what are y'all saying i gotta i gotta read this uh shining thank you hi mick hi um love this song happy holidays mick hopefully i'll get to see you i'll ha i'll get to see you this before the holidays are up dan gaddle that guy that guy's a legend if you don't know dan gaddle that guy's awesome um i used to call him nathan daniel gaddle merry christmas i wish i could meet you one day i hope i could get to meet you one day you know, 
Uh, I just quit my job serving. I was uh, I was on the beach for a long time and I was serving tables and it was great. And then uh, a hurricane hit and I lost my job there and I got a different job serving uh, by the mall here. And uh, I'm currently in Florida, I'm in Pensacola. And uh, I don't know, like I wasn't as busy and I wasn't making as much. And then I got offered a job by FedEx. So now I can record at home and I can like go to the gym and I can like get up in the morning and like I deliver my packages and then like, at like three or four in the afternoon, I'm like free. And then like, they, they like will pay for like my teeth and like my eye stuff, it's great. And then like, I never thought I would like moving packages so much, but here I am. And uh, I don't know, I've just been, I was supposed to go to LA in California and uh, my um, sound engineering school out there, they shut down. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, they shut down uh, while, while, like after I got accepted to uh, sound engineering school. So. In the meantime, I haven't been releasing a lot, but I have been writing a lot of songs. And like, because I've been writing so much, like I've just been getting, it's so funny. Like, like I haven't, I haven't met a girl or anything yet that like, um, I feel like a certain way about. And like, I'll meet someone and like, it'll maybe be like a one-time thing. And then, you know, she'll like, I've, I've been ghosted a few times out of school. And then I write really cool songs about it. You know, you know, it happens. And like, I, I love, like, I love that it happened, I hate, that it was happening like at the time obviously it like really sucked but like i've been so inspired to like just write i'm I basically writ written like two albums since i've lived here and um one of them i want to do like a simon and garfunkel style like i want to do like my buddy my buddy tucker who like plays and sings and stuff i want to do like a it's like an ep like a shorter album maybe like seven to ten songs and i want it to be a lot of like male harmonies and like super like instrumental, like a lot of like banjo and like guitar and stuff in there. And then another album, I wanna do a second storm folk album, like straight up like the heart of storm folk. Like I want like a lot of upright pianos and like violins. And, um, and I'm literally like orchestrating all this stuff. And like today I was working on a few storm folk songs and like I was just sitting on my bed, like going through them. And like, I, I really feel like I have enough. And I think like, get on, get on another song. Um, get Will on another, oh, get Will on with another song. I need to get Will on drums. Actually, I have a few songs with drums that I would actually really like him. He will be on another song. That is a promise. Because I a lot of my live performances, I, I play a bass drum and a tambourine on my foot and I don't really need a drum set. But there are songs that like totally call for a drum set that I can't um, fill up with just that bass drum and tambourine. Um, but anyway, uh, let's let's do another song. Let's uh, here. Let's do this. Let's do a Christmas song. The guitar's a little out of tune, but I don't feel like going off and tuning it here. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night. Our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and our soul felt its worth. A thrill. I need to, I need, I'm gonna exit out of this for a second so I can tune my 
so I can tune my guitar. So it might, I might lose this, lose the string, but I got to tune. Perfect. Oh, and you guys stuck around too. That's crazy. All right. I'm going to show you a song I'm writing. It's not even done. I don't even care. What's up, Alexa? I think this song is called Heavy. I wasn't quite ready. Something this heavy and on my walls come down like waterfalls. Why didn't you stay? That's all I really have of it. I want to write more of it. <clears throat> um, what's something else I can show you? Um, down the walls. Here we go. Uh, I wrote this song about a girl. And um, I think it's about more of a, it's like about a really religious girl. And um, maybe she like wants to feel or like be herself. And like um, she's told, like she can't feel or can't show uh, those emotions. So um, it'd be like uh, a guy um, going and meeting her one day, maybe at like uh, work or something. And like um, she's just got a lot of guards up. And um, I don't know. I'll just play the song. Let down, let down the walls you've built inside. Read me wrong, and I'll treat you right, and I'll hit my low and spread my light. You read me wrong, and I'll treat you right.
secrets are buried in churches and I keep them so buried it hurts me temptations they loom like cathedrals and I'm waiting to share it with people <laughs> Just let go. You guys have any requests? Beautiful song. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Should I do, um, I don't know. What do you want to hear? Do you want to hear something more soft or something like more loud? I can talk about my life. I can talk here. Do an altar call. Hello, everyone. It's a great day to be alive today in church. <laughs> it's a beautiful day to be alive. No, um, my name is Mick Groeschel, and um, I grew up most of my life in a... Oh, that was a song of mine. That was a song. The one I just played was a song of mine. Uh, it's on release. I haven't released that one yet. Thank you. I appreciate the hearts. I would love to hear your story. I'm going to tell my story in Australian. You ready? Okay. So I grew up. Um, until about the age of 10 years old. Thank you, Summerlin. So do you prefer to call me, what, well, call me? Can I call you Summer or do you like Summerlin better? Which one do you prefer? Let me know. There's like, I see the underscore there. Is Lynn like a middle name or is it like supposed to be like one big name? Or is it a last name? Um, oh, I was telling my story. Here, I'll just stop playing for a sec because I get really distracted. Um, so, I was born in Mobile, Alabama. It's like the part of the Alabama right there at the bottom. And um, my parents um, were happily married, everything else. And um, I grew up in the country about an hour north of that uh, in a county called Clark County. Summer, Lynn is my middle name. I got you. I can do that. I can call you Summer. Um... So I grew up in Clark County in a little town called Thomasville, and I grew up just west of it. If you look at it on a map, it's actually called Opine, O-P-I-N-E, Opine, Alabama. And I lived on a farm out there, and um, I lived there with my, my sister and my mom and my dad, and it was a big farm. We had like 100 acres. I grew up with seven horses, and we had about 200 cows, and we like had, gar I lived the whole country life. Like, um, I was... My dad never really had the accent though, and that's why I never really got it, because my dad was born in Connecticut, and then he grew up in California. And um, he met my mom in Florida, so my dad was military, so he moved everywhere. And then once he got out of the Air Force, uh, he did like home improvement and like contracting and construction and stuff. And then um, him and my mom, whenever they met, they started doing uh, Aflac, and they sold Aflac insurance. So I grew up in a, a mildly wealthy home, like um, they were making well over 100000 a year. And then... Um, I went to a very poor home. Like once my parents divorced, um, my dad lost his, you know, like his assets and stuff with Aflac that my mom had. And then um, my dad kind of like, he, he was a lot of things. He like did home improvement again. And then he was like a church custodian for a while. And like, we literally just made ends meet and we just made it work, but I'll get to that. So I was growing up in Alabama and my sister was a really good softball player. And so we moved to Gulf Shores, right on the beach of Alabama, right on the coast, um, probably about not even 45 minutes from where I'm living now, because um, I'm in Florida on the coast, and it's right across the line. So um, we're in Gulf Shores, and that's where my family uh, divorced. And then I was pretty much in Gulf Shores until I was like in middle school. I don't know, I made it till about 
I made it to almost to ninth grade. I think I think they divorced right at the beginning of my ninth grade year. And then I moved to Melbourne, Florida, which is in South Florida with my father. And my sister was already off to college and uh, she was like three and a half years ahead of me. So whenever uh, they went to, whenever me and my dad were in Melbourne, we stayed uh, with a good family of ours. And then we eventually got our own place. And then um, we basically just grew up together. Like ever since I was like 14 years old, all the way up until 19. And that's whenever my dad uh, died. Um, he died of cancer. He died of uh, melanoma. So melanoma is cancer from the sun. It's like skin cancer. And um, me and him were both really big surfers. So we lived together. And then, um, but I was already off in college by the time he got sick with cancer. So I graduated in 2013. And um, at the time I was like pretty, I was, I was super Christian. I was like volunteering for this church. And I like, I served, uh, like I volunteered as much as I could. And then, um, I, I kind of like completely flopped like the opposite direction. Like I was serving in church for a long time. And then I like, and then I like just had this like rebellion. Actually, I want to write a book. I want to write a book one day. This is one of my many things that I want to do, but I want to write a book called the implied rebellion. Kind of like how a lot of like 20 something year olds don't really go to church. And the ones that do are pretty prude and looked at as like yuppie kind of like in our age group because I don't even know if I'd really consider myself a, a, like exactly a Christian anymore because I don't like how that name is associated nowadays like I don't like the bad rap that Christians put out for all the other ones and it's like really I just I just hate it like um they, they really ruin it for like um because I, I believe like the essence of it all should just be loving others and like like a complete like removal of all judgment like like have tattoos just I, I don't know, man. Like, I just have, like, my my view of it all. And I just think, um, I just think grace is wider than people make it. And I think, like, we seek what we desire, right? So if you want a really strict, um, if you want a really strict upbringing and really strict, you know, a lot of parents believe that their kids and stuff should be put in religion or whatever whenever they're really young and it builds good character. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think it's okay. Like, I love public school. I believe, like, it... it rounds out a person i don't believe being sheltered your whole life and being told only stuff that christians believe is necessarily good for you i believe in science and i believe that it all should align and i believe that you know like i just have like my things i like i really hold true nowadays and i, I didn't really believe it until i was like 17 18 years old and then once you start to get older you just kind of start thinking of yourself and i think everyone does this you just kind of pull it apart and then you'll put it back together however you wish and it's kind of no one's opinion really matters it's kind of like wherever you are. But, um, there's, there's like a few things, but anyway, I'll get back to my story. So I was in Melbourne, right? And Melbourne's by Cocoa Beach, Florida. I know you've heard of Cocoa Beach. That's what everyone says. Cause no one knows where Melbourne is. And then, um, went to high school, graduated. I got a, I got almost a full scholarship. I got like a half scholarship to FAU, which is down in, um, Boca Raton is Fort Lauderdale area, North of Miami. My phone went into low power mode. I'm at 20%. This always happens whenever I live stream because I always live stream at the end of the day. Um, I, I got my scholarship in theater. By the way, in high school, I never really did any sports. Um, I was in band. I basically did band from fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And then I even did peewee football because whenever you're in middle school, you can kind of do both. And then once I hit ninth grade, I stopped playing football and um, I just, I was just better at music. I just, I wasn't really good at football, even though I was a big guy. Like, um, so I just did music. And then I remember um, I went out for drum major my senior year of high school. And um, my senior year, I didn't make drum major. And um, whenever I got rejected drum major, I was like, ah, like, I'm yours. So I'm just going to quit band. <laughs> and I did, I straight up, I quit band. I was doing theater at the time. And I went out for swim team, and I'm a I'm kind of a heavy guy, but I was more I was more lean at that time, and like um, I, I it was so much fun. Like I had a whole new group of friends, and I did I did swimming in high school, and then I still got a scholarship for um, acting and musical theater. I lost all my band scholarships, so whenever you decide to quit band your senior year of high school, that's what happens. So. But it was really cool. I got the uh, senior superlative. I remember uh, getting musically talented. I remember being called to the office like during the day in school whenever they're doing like senior superlative. And that day is so funny to me because I was dating this girl at the time named Madison. And Madison got biggest flirt. <laughs> and I was, and I got most musically talented like for the guys. Most musically, 
And I was like, what the heck? You got biggest flirt. And like, but it was so fun because we both got to leave class that day. And um, oh man, that was just so great. And we ended up being friends, me and Madison. And then she ended up marrying one of my other friends named Jay. And I love Jay. Like, I love him so much. It's, I think I have this curse. Like my curse is I'm the last guy a girl will date before she dates the guy that she marries. <laughs> so I'm like a good luck charm, but it just fucking sucks. <laughs> like for me, <laughs> cause I don't know. I don't know why, but like that seemed to happen. Also, um, this year I've, I've seen, I've dated, I've had really good luck with lesbians. A part of the reason I cut my hair off, not all the reason, a lot of the reason it was nappy, but I, I really kept, I really kept like getting with girls that were only into girls. And I was like, eh, what's happening here? Maybe I should like redefine what's going on here. And then, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think I just give off the wrong vibe because I'm straight. Right. <laughs> and, but like, I, I will have like, um, like at work, I'll have like gay guys come on to me and they're like, Hey, like, and I was like, I know, I, I know I don't give off the best impression, but I promise you I'm, I'm straight. <laughs> like I'm really not gay at all, but I'm, I, I love gay. I, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I guess I'm just too lovey. I don't know. I don't know what I am. I don't really mean to give the wrong impression of it all. I know this is, this is crazy. I love the long locks. This short hair is working too. I appreciate that. You know, I don't even know what's going on with my hair right now at this moment. I know I have like one more haircut before I cut all the blonde out of this thing. I keep getting sidetracked off of my story, but uh, let me pick up. Um, so I ended off with my senior year, I graduated from Melbourne. I went off to FAU, which was in Boca Raton, and I got a scholarship for acting in theater. And while I was in Boca Raton, um, I got a call from my sister around the end of my semester, and she told me that our dad was sick and um, he had had a doctor's appointment, and um, I, should, I should consider moving back home. So that December, uh, I ended my first semester at FAU, and um, middle of my freshman year, I went back up to Melbourne. And in Melbourne, uh, I didn't want to stop my school. Um, I wanted to keep going to school. So I ended up taking like, like a small amount of classes on the side at the local state college that was there in Melbourne. And then um, my dad ended up passing and I ended up living with church families. I ended up living with two different church families. And um, it was just, I was just surrounded by people that loved me and people that supported me. And like, it was just a really cool time to like, and I didn't really know how to express uh, grief or anything. I really didn't grieve for my dad. Like I remember crying like the day it happened, like the, the day he passed, you know, I was, I was probably weeping like a baby. And, um, and then after about like the 20 or 30 minutes of just weeping, I like kind of went numb for a little bit. And, um, actually like years later, um, I was dating uh, Kaylee at the time. And I remember there was this night that I forgot what word we did that day, but I remember I was sitting next to her on her couch and I just like let it out. And I was just like sobbing. And I, she was like, what the heck? Like, what was happening? Like, why are you crying? And like, I was just sobbing. I, I, I was just weeping. And I finally allowed myself to feel like, and I, I allowed myself to like, let go. And like, and I still remember moments of his and I still love him to death. And I hope one day I'll see him again, you know? That's just life. But it's like dealing with death and you either gotta deal with it whenever you're younger or you gotta deal with it when you're older. But like, death is just a part of life, man. And uh, it sucks to go through it. And um, so after I moved home and then he passed and I lived with church families, I got accepted into University of Central Florida. And um, the girls love you and boys too. You're lucky. <laughs> That's actually a really big thank you. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, <laughs> but thanks. Um, ended up going to UCF and it was great because I, uh, I ended up moving in with two high school buddies of mine. Uh, I ended up moving in with Cody and Jake and um, I went to UCF and I remembered I was in like my, I don't know, I was like a year, a year and a half in the UCF and um, I was doing gigs. I was doing music at the time. I was playing in Disney and that's where I was making all my money and I was only doing a few gigs a week and um, I played with this girl Rebecca for a while and then I played with this girl Sydney for a while and then I dated Kaylee and then Kaylee and I started Stormfolk together. And um, all that time I was going to UCF. But um, I dropped out of UCF, I actually went on academic probation because I made a D in a class. And if you make a D in a big university like that, they make you take a semester off. 
And I remember, um, but they, you're still part of the school. Like you can take a semester off and then come back and then retake the classes. And I never went back. Like once I dropped out of college, I just decided to never go back to college. And I, I was, I was pretty, I'm pretty certain that I'm supposed to be a songwriter. I don't know if I'm supposed to be famous. I don't really care about being famous. I think I'm just here to write songs. And I have these seasons where I release a bunch of songs. And then I have like these times where I just write a bunch of songs. And you usually don't have both in the same time frame. Usually like something's going on and you're just writing and writing and writing. I wrote one yesterday in the shower. <laughs> like, you, and you just try to like record them as quick as you can before you forget them. And then I have moments where I'll come home from work or whatever I do and I'll open up my audio you know, logs in my phone and I'll just go back and listen to them. I'm like, yeah, I know what I was trying to go for here. And I always try to like hum the key and I try to get the tempo of the song and I try to like sing whatever melody I was hearing you know, whatever words I was hearing and then I'll go. That's how I wrote uh, Broken Lovers and Broken Lovers was like from a dream. Uh, every night whenever I sleep, I listen to music when I sleep. I listen to like Lord of the Rings, like calm, like music, or I listen to like a p calm piano or like I, anything like instrumental music, like feeling emotional music. It really calms me down. It really puts me in like my happy place. I don't know what it is, but I think it looks like the Shire in Lord of the Rings. Don't judge me. That's just my happy. But I, I really get inspired while I'm like, I'll wake up and I'll have like something in my head. And maybe I did hear like a chord or a key from a song, but it, I usually don't know the song and I don't know what the heck it was, but I'll write something new from that. And I'll like just go off and just tell a whole story and whatever's like being, I don't know, whatever was cooking in my brain whenever I heard it. And then, um, I'm really excited. I, um, I just wrote this song this year, uh, called Gloria Victoria Groshall. <laughs> it's called Gloria Victoria Groshall. <laughs> and, uh, I, I don't know why I was there, but I was online and, um, somehow I like found like my dad's obituary and like, you can like look up your name like online and literally like you can look at like your family lineage and like, you can see like when people have died and like what, what they died of and like what year and like, there were like more gross shawls than I ever thought were like in the world. And I was like reading all the names. And then there was this one from like 1893 or something. It was like older, it was like late 18, early 1900s. And I guess it was documented or logged. And um, it was this girl uh, that had this name, Gloria Victoria. And um, in the cause of death underneath it said stillborn. And I was like, and it just hit me. It hit me so hard, like stillborn. So she never lived. She was like named and the parents and it was documented and the, the child never lived. So I, I thought about how that would feel with a, a father and a, and a wife having a kid. And like, um, I don't know, like the kid growing in the wife for nine months and then like you, you have birth and then there's no child. Like that's got to be like the most devastating thing in the world. And I can't imagine like what you lean on, like it's either religion or people or nothing. Like I just, and it, like, I was so emotional. I ended up getting upset over it. And I, and I, it was like the middle of the night and I, and I saw this thing. I was like on my iPhone on Safari and I wrote like probably 15 stanzas of this song. And then uh, by the time I woke up, I like had a melody and like, and it, it's so funny. My mom who just helped me put up this tree, she just left. Uh, me and my mom are mending our relationship. We actually have a pretty broken relationship since my family went through a divorce and all that stuff. So like, we're trying to work on it. Like my mom and I will have dinner every once in a while. And I don't know, it, it's, it sucks because it's kind of weird and there's a lot of pain there, but um, we're working on it. Family's hard. I'm sure you understand what it's like. Uh, family is weird. I'm going to try to get on a happier note here because I know a lot of what I'm saying is probably a little depressing. But anyway, songs, they're, they're coming. And I, I, I'm sorry I'm not releasing every month. A lot of the biggest reason why I'm not releasing every single month is because most of my songs are not just me. And I don't, I'm not casting blame onto other people, but whenever you, you write a song, usually I've been learning that song for oh, well over a year, or either I wrote that song and I felt comfortable enough to record it and I had an arrangement for it and I had words and lyrics for it. But whenever you send it, like whenever I pick a girl that I want to feature on a song, she's got to relearn the whole thing. And then she's got to think about what parts she needs to sing on it and it, it, like what part she sings lead and what part she sings harmony. And we got to talk on the phone about, you know, what I'm thinking. And then basically there's a part of me that gives up my vision in a sense. And like, there's a reason I chose Lily, you know, to sing on Paradise. And there's a reason I chose Rebecca to sing with my, like, 
I believe that they can bring something to these songs that I never even heard in the songs. And, and I tell them to just take it and run with it and like maybe do like record like, you know, seven or eight times through the way I wanted it. But like, you, like the other takes, like all the way up to 15 takes or whatever, like really just do your thing and fill it out. So like people have lives, you know, and like a lot of the people who, people who I feature aren't even like musicians in their daytime. Like they have jobs, like, and you just gotta like, make free time for it and I and I always you know try to pay them usually I'll pay vocalists anywhere from like 75 bucks to like 100 bucks like maybe 50 bucks whatever I, whatever I really like have like because I don't make a ton of money either like everyone's like tight COVID sucks and like it just but I, I really am so passionate about like just these songs and I don't want to release them half-ass like I really think they deserve um all the work into it they like it takes a lot of time to record all the guitar on the left side and the guitar on the right side and the mandolin and the banjos and you got to go through and you got to record them and you got to at least get six times per side and you got to mix the drums where it doesn't sound muddy and it doesn't interview like it's just such a, a time consuming thing like even though it's one four minute song or whatever it is it takes it takes weeks of work just to release a song and and that's why artists probably release an album a year. It's not that they're right, not writing more songs. It's just that it's so time consuming or else you're so rich that you can afford it. And unfortunately, a lot of the folks who are rich, maybe this is a generalization, but think of it this way. Like imagine having a lot of money and you really want to be a musician and you have no talent whatsoever, or you have no like instilled gifts in you, but you have all the money to make it work. And then like you get rich but, and you get, and you get famous because you can afford to spread it all around. Now imagine like the best musician you know, like a lot of the best guys I know and the best girls I know that are like incredibly talented singers and incredible, they're like just barely making it. Like they might not make any money and they don't have enough and they don't know how to mix and produce. Like it's hard, like really getting a break is a lot of money into it and it's a lot of like, it is really who you know and like who's in your family and my family doesn't know anyone from the music world. <laughs> like. You really just gotta share your gift and you're gonna have your own crowd and you're gonna have people that are passionate for um, whatever you, you give and you're gonna have, oh, that's my coffee pot. You know why it's going off? Because I made hot chocolate like an hour and a half ago. And I guess it's got tired of keeping the water hot. Anyway, it's not a smoke alarm. Um, yeah, um, so I went to UCF, uh, started a band Storm Folk while I was in Orlando with uh, my girlfriend at the time. And then, um, gosh, we started arguing all the time, like all the time, like probably like five months in, like we even got counseling for a while. And then like, um, it just got really bad. Like we kept trying to make it work and it wasn't working, but we knew we built this band together already. And like, we just became so ill towards one another. We didn't even want to see each other. And then like, we ended up just seeing each other at work whenever we do shows and we didn't even want to see each other. So, um, we ended up breaking up as a couple and we ended up breaking up as a band a few months after that and um it was all kind of crazy but um i ended up leaving orlando and i ended up going to nashville because i had just met some friends at the time in nashville and i had a good buddy jack who lived there and my friend piper lived there and my buddy hunter lives there now and and i just like i was like hey like i'm a musician i might as well go to nashville nashville is not my city Nashville's not my city because I'm not country. I'm, I really don't, I appreciate country music and I love the feeling of walking into a bar and hearing like good warm country music. But like, I can't perform country music. I don't sound country. Like I love Casey Musgraves and you tell it someone who likes country and they go, that's not even real country. <laughs> like, like I, I, just, I just can't really do it. And, and whenever I would perform in these bars in Nashville, um, they, would, they would be like, all right, like, that was good. And they're like, but we wanna hear whatever and a Blake Shelton song or like all these country art Luke Combs was really big and like I just didn't know these artists and I didn't really care about it so I was kind of playing music I didn't really care about like and who wants to do that you know and there were other jobs like I could be a server anywhere you know I could be a and like East Nashville which was more like folky and hip they there weren't really paying gigs so I couldn't get a gig that paid well for music I wanted to play but if it was music I didn't really want to play and it was just kind of the music everyone knew or like country music, I could play downtown and like get paid good for it, but it would wear me out and I like wasn't full. So like in a sense, I like didn't like it, but I'm really grateful because I, 
I gigged a lot there with Emma and Emma was super country and she like held it down. Like I got to do a full gear song and they would go back to Emma and she would kill like Carrie Underwood's song and she, she was just so good. Look up Emma Zink. That girl is the most talented freaking female singer. I, I know she's, she's so good. And now she's got a label and everything and she's like recording her own songs. I'm really excited to hear it. I bet you she's gonna release something soon. But um, gosh, it was so great. Cause like Emma and her girlfriend, um, Chelsea, Chelsea was a bartender in downtown Nashville. And then Emma was playing gigs at the bars and Emma allowed me to come on her team as a duo with her. And like, we just duoed for months and it was just the best thing. Um, you lived a thousand lives. There's, there's always, there's a story. Of course, everyone has their story. Like, I'm just, I don't know why I just started telling mine and stopped playing music. I imagine like, I like, I like for you guys to hear processed music from me. <laughs> just like this raw live stuff. I, I'm not the best guitar player and I'm not the best live singer, but I, I really feel like it's like the heart behind the music. And I, whenever I play you a song I write, I really hope that you guys can like, I don't know, like the same anointing and like pain and grief that went into the song. It's like, and like hope in a song. Cause I like all my songs have some, some essence of hope in them. Like you guys just feel and relate to that. And if you don't, that's okay. Like, I'm sure like you have your artists and if it's not me, that's cool too. I don't care, whatever. I think I'm just here to write my songs and like tell my story. Um, so yeah, ended up going to Nashville. I lived there for about seven or eight months. I remember my last month there was a pretty rough month for me financially because um, I got in a car accident and it was this um, underage driver and they, they hit me and then like, uh, I felt so bad about it. I didn't like follow the claim cause they, they were like, I don't know, I just felt bad. I guess, I don't know, I felt bad for the girl that like hit me, she was crying and then like her mom came to the thing. Anyway, and then my rent was due too and I had to fix my car and I just got in a financial like shit storm at the end of Nashville. So I remember um, being in panic mode and I called my sister and I was like, if I don't pay my rent this month and I just use the rest of my money for a U-Haul, can I come down to Florida? And she was like, yeah, come on. <laughs> and so like I drove down the, Pensa freaking cola, like of all places. And like, uh, I stayed with my sister for months and uh, Zach had to tolerate me, took me, no, I'm just kidding, I love him to death. KK and Zach like took care of me for so long. And then I finally got my own place uh, with a coworker of mine. And um, he's actually not here right now, Josh. But my roommate is Joshua. And uh, I ended up getting a job first at a gym and then I got a job, um, at a coffee shop for a while here. And then uh, I've, I've been a bouncer. I started working in a club and I would like throw guys out. <laughs> and like, I don't know, you just diffuse situations as a bouncer. And then uh, I met a lot of people that way, made a lot of enemies that way. It's fine, you know, you, you, you're you called to love everyone, not to like everyone, that's okay. <laughs> and uh, after I uh, left the coffee shop at the time and bouncing, I uh, got a job on the beach um, serving and then, uh, lost that job hurricane i already talked about this at the beginning of this video and then um yeah now i just got hired at fedex and my first day with fedex is on uh thursday so tomorrow i have the day off i'm really stoked about my day off tomorrow because i i've been working doubles like every single day and i've been posting nothing and not recording anything and now i'm gonna start recording stuff and i'm stoked about it you need a book oh my god maybe one day if I, if I feel like writing a book, I'll make the whole thing rhyme. Oh, my senior year of high school, got an A in AP literature because I wrote my final paper, which was five pages, and I made the whole thing rhyme. Not bragging, but slight flex. Oh, FedEx, that's interesting. Yeah, man, uh, I won't be as big as Autumn Roses who like, you know, like vlogs every single day that she does UPS and she has a really like cute voice and is also really hot. I don't think I can pull that, but I'll, I'll definitely try to like video what working for FedEx is like. You know what I'm stoked about? I think most of the day that I'm like just driving, delivering, I'm gonna be like walking a lot and running a lot, which is gonna be cool, it's gonna be exercise. And like, I don't have to talk to a ton of people. And like, I think I'm just gonna listen to a lot of music. So I'm gonna listen to podcasts, I'm gonna listen to books, and I'm just gonna like listen to music, and I think I'm gonna write songs, and I'm gonna be able to like write songs anytime I want, especially whenever I'm like on the road, and I, I don't know. I just think, and like having the day off, like having the nights off, like I can't remember the last time I've like not worked on a Friday night or a Saturday night, like 
Cause I'm all, I feel like I'm always fucking serving like on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays and like, it's just the same old shit. So serving is definitely a really good way to make fast money and not wait two weeks for a paycheck. And, and like, here's the thing, secret trick. If you've never served before and you want to get hired as a server, you have to, <laughs> in Pensacola at least, I had to lie to get hired as a server. And here's the lie I had to tell, because I hate lies and I always tell the truth, but I had to lie because a boss who I was trying to get the job from told me that I would have to lie to get the jobs. And um, basically most places will say, you need three years of experience or you need two years of experience or they'll say whatever about your experience. And then um, you lie about the experience and you say you've had three years of experience. Maybe if you've worked at a place as a busser or as a hostess or as whatever, maybe it wasn't a server or maybe it wasn't a bartender. You say you did, because 99% of the time, they're not gonna call your references. They're not gonna call, be like, yeah, I've served before, like I've served at Carabas or whatever. And I was a busser at Carabas. I've served at Carabas, you know, whatever. And they're like, oh, great. Like, he's he's a server, he doesn't have, and then whenever you're there, you just ask questions. Be like, hey, I don't know your computer system. I don't know how to put that in. Can y'all show me? And they're like, yeah, of course we'll show you our computer. You're like, yeah, mine was different. You know, like, you just go along with it. And I feel like if you're personable and you don't even have to be introverts or so, like, it's whatever. It's just a job, a job. I order a lot of stuff. You're gonna pull up to my house one day? Nick, I would totally pull up to your house one day. I'll, I'll bring you the new PS5. I don't know if you already have it. Drop off some PS5, some Xbox Series Xs. Name for the book, The Lucky Boy, Mick and a Thousand Lives. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, whatever blows your hair back, you know? I don't think I'm, uh, you know what, you know what's funny? Uh, my boss said this, I got um, stiffed um, on a check and it usually happens about uh, like once a day or once every couple days. Uh, you'll get uh, customers that come in and they order food. And first off, if you're broke as fuck, why are you going out to eat? Like, what are you doing? Like, don't go to a restaurant and spend 30, 40, $50 on a meal if you have no money. Cause if you're not tipping people, like that's just a part of it. You should just walk into a place knowing you should tip 20% or 15%, whatever, tip something. But like, for you to be needy and me to run back and forth to the tables and you to be like, hey, we need more napkins. And uh, can I get some ranch with this stuff? And uh, we need some. Okay, my shit's at 10% and just notified me and stopped my stream. But anyway, usually the neediest tables are the ones that tip nothing or like shit. So just keep that in mind. If you ever get a job in customer service, usually the coolest people that'll tip you the most are the ones that don't really require a lot. So if you're doing your job and they're there like normal people, usually everything's gonna be fine. So that sucks. Anyway, um, here I am sitting on my floor in my room and I have four people currently live watching me right now. I don't know why, guys, it's a Tuesday night. I guess that's why. I don't know a lot's happening on a Tuesday. Yo, um, I wrote this, it's like symbolic. It's, um, I, I think I wrote it about my bandmate that I like, I've only written two songs about that, like as far as like starting a band and it being pretty successful. At least Stormfolk really was, it was like taking off. And then like we even opened up for Drake Bell or whatever his name is now. But like that was like our kind of our big thing. And like we got to meet Secondhand Serenade and like we became friends with them. And like they're big in Nashville and they did like, cause tonight will be the night that I will fall for you. So like they became our friends. And like we just started making friends that were like pretty big in the music thing. And then like broke up. But the, the stories that come out of those things, like um, I didn't really write songs about that or her until like this year. Like it was like years later. It was probably like, what has it been? Like three years or something? Like um, it just took me that long to process it. And then like come up, so a lot of the songs I write in these years are about stuff that happened like four or five years ago. And uh, I remember um, as I wrote my songs in high school and then I eventually recorded them, I recorded all of them and released my first album called Alas My Soul under my actual name, Mick Groshall, whenever I was 21. And I wrote most of them when I was like 15, 14, like in high school. And I remember, I remember showing it to my best friends. I remember Jamie really liking the song, like Alas My Soul, which is what the album was called. And it was just like, here, I'll play you. It's like, um, ahoy. There it is. So this is like one of my, probably my second song I ever wrote. It wasn't my first song. I remember my first song, but um, my, my, right in the beginning, 
It went like, ahoy, over the seas we go. We laugh, we sing, we wake up slow. We both knew that this time would come. Now love me is my heart drums on. We dance with music in slow dim light. The lost over these long cold nights. And I ask only to love your soul. Now it's sober, now see me go. And here's the chorus, it goes, Alas, my soul, awake my heart. I loved you so, right from the start. Now I will go, and you start of life. Once more, you walk right out the door. My heart's in pieces all on the floor. What's up, McKenna? <laughs> but I'm sure that when our time comes, This gone true love. So like that, and I'll go back to the chorus. Alas, my soul, awake my heart. I loved you so right from the start. Now I will go, and you won't know that I loved you. Start of light. I'm playing one of my first songs, by the way. It's called Alas My Soul. I will wait. Uh, chords. I will wait. I will fall just to be in your arms. We will go and we'll know that there's nothing to show. I will wait. I will fall just to be your arms we will go and we'll know that there's nothing to show Alas, my soul, awake my heart. I loved you so right from the start. Now I will go, and you won't know that I loved you so right from the start of life. The moment is gone, it's mine to sow. The moment is gone, alas my soul. Thank you. <laughs> alas my soul. Uh, I, I think I was in junior year of high school when I read that. and. Uh, I don't know. I, I really liked this girl. There's this girl named Haley Garrett. H-A-L-E-I-G-H. -I, -E I just remember how she spelled her name. And I remember she was a soccer player. And I was a band kid. And she didn't even like me. <laughs> I just, isn't it funny how it always works that way? The girls that you like really fall for. The ones you, you like love in a sense. Like the ones that like really love someone else. And then like that person really loves. <laughs> you know like it's just a big triangle. Like you can never like. I don't know. It. And then like the people you date and the people you work out with and eventually like 
marry or get together. Those are the ones that you just happen to fall in that like love you either just as much or almost as much as you like, you know, like usually it's never like equally a hundred percent until like either later on, but like we fall really hard. And then like, I remember like as a young teenager, you know, you get, you just, all your emotions are hitting you for the first time in a sense. And like, you, like I just didn't know how to express, everyone has a way of expressing your stress. And like, my, my way is just like freaking writing it in a poem. I don't know. A lot of the times I'll write poems. And if I write a poem, it's because whenever I was inspired to write it, like there was no melodies in my head. So like one of the hardest things like I think I can do as a songwriter is like go back to old poems and like write like music to them. It's like really tough because I, I really intended it just to be a poem. And like um, where you write hooks and like music, sometimes there's like, it, like at least for me, it's like easier to go back and fill in words on top of music than it is to put music on top of words, you know? Because usually you gotta take stuff out in order for it to fit in time and stuff like that. I don't know. But I like this old song thing that we're doing right here. Let's 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 keep playing old songs. What is another song I wrote? Heart is all I need. How's it go? Hard. There it is. Gosh. Old songs, man. So, uh, I remember uh, this song that I'm about to play. I was in uh, college. I was in my freshman year of college. And it was whenever I was back home for college. And, um, it was like a humanities class and we had to like bring a poem in the class that we had written. And I remember I brought this poem and I was so, I was so like, it like fit the criteria for like what we needed. And I think it was like a love poem or whatever. And like, we had to discuss it as a group with like the other people. And I remember there's this really like beautiful girl in this class that sat right in front of me. And I like, I had the biggest crush on her. And I remember like sitting in the circle and like showing like what I had written. And she was like, <laughs> She just like ripped it apart. She was like, it feels forced. Like, does she have a say, you know, in the poem? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. Like I wrote this shit when I was like, I don't know, 17. Like, and here I am at 20 or whatever, 19 sitting in this college and like presenting this poem that I like organized even more. And like I presented and anyway, if you just hear the lyrics, it's a little corny, but you know, you can't help songs you write at the time. It's like, uh, yeah, that's just what was there, and sometimes you need corny stuff to feel. <laughs> so whatever. Uh, all right, it's part of growing up, though, knowing what's corny and what's not. And uh, I think it's like a it's like a skill that like a songwriter can have. It's like I'm just like ah, like I didn't really, I didn't really appreciate that. Actually, I I do have like a mini side story before I get started on this. Um, I, I somehow got in a room with uh my bandmate at the time with Stormfolk, um. I got in a room with the guy who wrote all of High School Musical. Like the guy who wrote all the music, like, like every day, like all of our lives. Like, and I remember uh, meeting the guy from The Voice. Um, his name was Peter Armato. He is our friend um, that did all the music on The Voice. And he like composed it and he got the tracks ready for the singers whenever they would perform on the show. And uh, we were friends with them in Orlando. And uh, we're in this hotel room with the guy that wrote High School Musical. So it was the guy from The Voice the guy from High School Musical and me and my bandmate. And I remember presenting him with my all. It was like, we had just um, started recording Stormfolk songs and we were releasing a song a month. And um, whenever I showed him with my all, he just wanted to take it all these different directions that like, to me was very corny. Like it was just so corny. I like wanted to like, I like hated them. And I, I showed him like, um, it was like, can we go back to way back when? to the old days when we were friends. And in that song, I remember I wanted it, I was very specific and I, and I didn't have the thing finished at the time. And I, whenever I showed him that idea, he goes, he, he like went off on like, I just remember this lyric. He was like, it's like, it's like, and love is a battlefield. And I was like, I hate that bro. He goes, 
He goes, no, no, it's really good. Like, love is a battlefield. And I was like, no, that's the worst shit I've ever heard, man. Like, and, and we just, like, straight up disagreed. So, like, now whenever I hear high school musical songs, I think of, like, and of course, like, it's so different. Cause, and, like, the dude was, like, in his, like, 50s probably he's older and I just I remember disagreeing with him so hard and it was not just that lyric but it was like other lyrics and I I think music is subjective and I think um like whenever he was writing it like it's really important to like hear the bigger vision like music isn't just what you sing it in the moment it's like what its potential could be so like maybe like songs I write isn't me singing them maybe it's someone else I mean it's you know someone famous singing them like you like writing songs you have to be open to letting your songs go and not grasping them so tight because like what if he wrote all the songs at high school musical and he just wanted to perform them it would be a shame because like a lot of the songs are actually really good and really catchy and i don't believe you always write hits i believe like 80 percent of the songs are for the songwriter like most of the songs that you share and you write and release i believe like people write them for themselves and then um the part that everyone loves that everyone relates to usually their biggest hits Maybe, maybe they're like the ones that they feel, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're the ones they're sick of that didn't really mean a lot to them. So I, I think like 10 to 20% of stuff that people write is going to be like hit worthy or like just so catchy that people just latch onto it. But like the other, like you have to write the shit to get the gold. Like you really do. Like you have to like go through bad songs and I don't know. That's just the, the way it works, at least from what I could tell. But um. I was a child I used to write to avoid you or a Pokemon and I choose you. You know, that's a good punch. If, if, if a girl today, if I was working or something and she wrote that on a card and gave it to you, she's like, you're a Pokemon and I choose you. I'd be like, that's hot. Let's go. You know, like, but to each their own, you know, <laughs> but no, that's good. I, that, you, you weren't wrong in that instance. I'm sorry it didn't work out with the guy. Okay. So um, here's the way this song is. Remember, this one was corny, and I think I wrote it around like 17 or 18. But um, this is the poem I presented in this class that apparently was too corny to bear. So here we go. It goes, Your sweetheart is all I need. You and your love, a guitar on the beach. We will watch the stars, stars. And sing a song, stars, sing a song. Oh my gosh, I don't even remember the chords. Sing a song together, just you and I forever chasing dreams. Tonight is a beautiful night. What's up, Marissa? How are you doing? The ocean and the sound of the tide. The sunset on the sea, and possibly we'll find love. Cause your sweetheart is all I need. You and your love, a guitar on the beach. And we will watch the stars and sing a song together. Just you and I forever chasing dreams. We'll watch the lights flicker blue on the sand. And in that moment, I'll reach for your hand. <laughs> and we saw a fire, you were all I desired. And it seems it was all just a dream. Your sweetheart is all I need. You and your love, a guitar on the beach. We will watch the stars and sing a song together. Just you and I forever chasing dreams. It's all like that. I think it's all guess. Uh, my phone is dying. Uh, but I'm going to do one more while I have battery left so I can post this live. Um, I'm going to do a song uh, I wrote, actually, um, 
My dad had already passed at the time and I was probably uh, 20 or 20, I think I was 21 or 22. And um, the whole time growing up, I played a lot of Xbox as a kid and um, it's a long story, but basically I had like these four friends that were on Xbox and I had one that lived in Arkansas, one that lived in Colorado, one that lived in Maryland. And um, what was the last city? Arkansas, Colorado, Maryland. Oh, it was, I was the fourth, sorry. So it was three friends. And then uh, the one from Arkansas was in town. And I never met him in person. His name was Drew. And he was vacationing with his family in Panama City. And um, I remember I was driving up that week. Just I just happened to be driving up from Orlando to Alabama. And I was driving like on I-10 past Panama City. And I'd never been to Panama City Beach before. So I, I stopped in and I and I went to a club with him that like we like I stayed the night with him and I like I don't know, I just had all my shit with me because I was going to stay with my mom. And he was with his big family there and like me and this guy named Zach. And Zach lives in Nashville and we were friends while I was in Nashville and hung out a few times. And then Drew all went out to this club and I remember like like Zach got kicked out for smoking a joint and like a club bar were there and like it was just a whole thing. And then but like while I was there I met these girls and um they were all sisters and they were like down for like a modeling thing or something. And um this girl, her name was uh, Sierra. And I told Sierra about this because I wrote Thunder Bay about her. Because, um, you know, whenever you meet someone, you go, hey, like, where are you from? And, like, usually that's the first or second question that you ask someone after their name. You know, like, and she was from Thunder Bay. And I was like, what a cool name. <laughs> and I just remember hearing Thunder Bay and I was in Stormfolk. And I was like, gosh, what a cool name, Thunder Bay. And it's a it's a big city in Canada. It's right on the, it's right on the, basically on the line of the United States and Canada. I think it's in Ontario. And um, it was right on a great lake there. And um, I just remember uh, having this incredible night with this girl that I did nothing with, like other than talk. Like we just talked and danced in a club and you know, all my friends are there and her friends are there and her, or she was, uh, two of her sisters are there and then like some other friends of hers are there. And uh, it was just a solid night. And um, I remember we ended up splitting up at the end of the night because um, they were going to this club that like had a cover fee for guys, but not for girls. Like they were letting girls in for free and guys had to pay like 15 or 20 bucks. And my buddy Drew and I just looked at each other and we're like, ah, like, <laughs> like, fuck it. Like, I don't want to pay the $15. It's already 1 AM, you know? <laughs> like, so we like didn't go in, we didn't go in this club and we ended up saying goodbye. And, and we just like, I just remember, I didn't even hug her or anything. I just remember like, I remember her sisters kind of looking the other direction. They were walking and like, she like turned around she like looked at me and she just kind of like, she like waved at me like, and there was like this, like, there's like this hope in her eye or something. I don't know. It was there. And like, I really liked her. And like, and that was it. Like that was the end of it. And like, but I had her phone number. Like I got her number that night while I was with her. So like we texted kind of like, even whenever she went back home and, um, not even like, like in the same week, the same week I wrote with my all, I wrote Thunder Bay about this girl that I met in a club from Thunder Bay. And while I was writing this chorus, like I actually started with a verse on that song. And um, I remember there was this one lamp in like the room I was in. And I was like, man, like it's like, it's like midnight and like a light's on and I'm working. Like, why am I working in the middle of the night? And like, literally like, it felt like work writing this song because I was tired, but like I couldn't go to sleep. I had, I had to get it out. And um, the first line was like, a light is on and I'm working. And um, I don't know, from there, like the song took off and I just thought about coldness and like, I talk about the Arctic and I talk about like storms and stuff, like storms that would be up north that wouldn't necessarily be in the United States. And then um, whenever it came to the chorus, it was like Thunder Bay and um, I'm singing Bay, um, Hey, Away, you know, you're thinking of rhymes. And um, it was, and I remember, <laughs> I remember going to my maps on my Apple maps and like, I think I was in, um, wherever at the time, it was like 1,900 and something miles away. It was like, so it was basically two miles, 2,000 miles away. So I was like Thunder Bay and I remember writing it down and it was like 2,000 miles away. I was like, okay, that's a chorus, like that's it. And like, and like, I will wait. Like I will wait was a big Mumford song at the time. And like, I will stay. And like, there were lots of things that rhyme with Thunder Bay. So anyway, with this song, I'll go ahead and play it. Um, I love this song and it means a lot to me, so. Here we go, Thunder Bay. The light is left on and I'm working. It's blinding my eyes and I'm searching. I'm 
2,000 miles from my heart, from my heart, started fires in mine. It's hard not to wake heavy-minded, to search for love and not find it. Months pass me by, and it's you in my mind still. Oh, I will arise to search the night for your light. I will be strong when I'm pulled down by fright. I'll rise from the ash. And I'll find my harness You're a storm in the Arctic Thunder Bay Two thousand miles away Oh, it paused for a second I will wait in search of your embrace And I will stay Till love can find its place Thunder Bay Two thousand miles away A breath, no second chance guaranteed. The seas won't drown you out, and the fires won't burn you down. The wind and rain will shout, and the waves come crashing down. Your light, it won't go out as you lay your body down. We will throw off our crowns when we arrive. Like thunder bay, two thousand miles away. Oh, I will wait to love and find. thousand miles away anyway I think my phone's about to die and I don't want to lose the stream so I'm gonna plug it in real quick and then I'm gonna try to post this live before my shit dies Ooh. Ooh. this thing is frozen oh uh. oh my gosh this filter is horrible I'm so sorry you watched me do this thing for so long but um Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you guys just hearing some of my story. Like it's honestly like everyone has been incredible. You guys send me messages like every day and like it just like makes my, and it's so funny cause I can feel like I'm doing nothing. I, I feel like I'm just working and not doing anything really significant in my life. And like you guys are kind from thousands, literally thousands of miles away. And like someone will hear storm folk in another country and they'll just message me about how the song impacted their day. And it like, just because one person felt the song, like that makes, that makes all this worth it. 
and it makes being famous or not being famous or people hearing it or, you know, it makes all that stuff like doesn't really matter as much. It really is about like just the people you can reach. And that's like what I'm grateful for. And um, I love all of you and I hope you all have a wonderful night and I'm going to end this stream and uh, I appreciate you watching and y'all, y'all just, I might go watch the Mandalorian or something. I don't know what I'm going to do, but uh, I'm going to get off of here because my phone is dead. So bye y'all. Love y'all.